Dr. Schwartz attended medical school at Wayne State University in Detroit, Michigan, and completed his residency in physical medicine and rehabilitation at the University of Texas Health Science Center, which was in San Antonio. He is board certified in physical medicine and rehabilitation, pain management, electrodiagnostic medicine, orthopedic medicine, and medical thermography. He's also a fellow in vascular medicine. He's kind of got it all covered. <laughs> Dr. Schwartz has lectured extensively through the United States, Europe, Asia, and has a long list of distinguished publications. He actually has a wonderful book that I'm sure he'll tell you about that I've read several times. I have it at home. I just didn't write it down. Um, these include innovations, dysautonomia, neuromusculoskeletal pain syndromes, and disorders with autonomic components. Um, Dr. Schwartz has served in numerous capacities for the American Academy of Thermology and has been the chairman of the board since 2016. Dr. Schwartz is the course director for the American Academy of Thermology's online medical education thermology offerings and is the program chair of the American Academy of Thermology annual scientific session. And I will tell you, I've gone to one of those. It's, it's intense. They do. They talk a lot. Um, but without further ado, we're going to start this off, and he'll elaborate on everything that I just said. So welcome. Thank you. The key words, they talk a lot. I, I, I was just on a Zoom call. It was an international call, actually, and somebody was introducing the AAT, to me to the AAT, to other groups. And the, the host said to the guests, and he can talk as much about this stuff like we talk about our stuff. He just doesn't shut up. <laughs> so anyways, I will try not to do that right now. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here. Um, it's always an honor to be involved with Fight the Flame. Uh, I don't really know how to express this. So I, I present, the talk is on scientific medical thermology. And at the American Academy of Thermology, we strongly differentiate the word thermography from thermology, because thermology is scientific medical applications of the technology. Thermography is kind of everything else in our point of view. And you'll hear and see that, hopefully, by the end of today's talk. And it's going to be in CRPS, RSD. I'm sorry, I've been doing this for decades and decades. You're going to hear me call it RSD. I don't really refer to it as CRPS. And we use it dysautonomia because it's the autonomic nervous system. Everybody with RSD knows about the fight or flight system and autonomic nervous system, so I don't need to explain that per se. But it really, the medical community is all of a sudden, maybe after 40 years of barking, listening to the word dysautonomia more than the word RSD. So that's kind of our, our pathway into medical education. Um, I formally represent the American Academy of Thermology as chairman of the board. I've been in private practice since 1984 at Piedmont Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation in Greenville, South Carolina. And I also put down there that I feel in many ways I represent, or at least I'm a strong advocate of Beth and Steve and Fight the Flame. Um, they've just done a ton for this condition in terms of supporting people, supporting the cause, and supporting where it's headed. And um, really, before I go any further, I think they deserve a round of applause. Okay, so um, I've got about an hour. I actually have another engagement. I have to leave after this, so um, I will try to leave as much time for questions and answers as we can. Um, scientific medical thermology, it's an imaging modality, and it validates complaints. It serves as an extension of the physical exam, and it assists in clinical decision making. And for the physicians in the room, it's really important that when we go through your physician online training courses, you know, the FDA does not allow any device, whether it be a wearable from Apple or whether it be an EKG monitor, to report anything other than the word findings. And in the case of thermal imaging, the finding is temperature. And if you see or ever see something that's written that talks about all these things in the findings that aren't the words temperature, they're in violation of law. And that pretty much came out in November of uh, 2021. FDA finally um, solidified that from software as a medical device. And if you say anything other than the word finding, that device or software has to be treated like a drug and go through um, PMAs, and just like it's a brand new drug. 
So one of the key roles that the American Academy of Thermology uh, provides, we're a nonprofit. And our only purpose is to educate and promulgate the use of scientific medical thermology. As physicians, we're allowed to say whatever we want. We're allowed to take that data, that research data, and promote it and public it. Publicate it, publish it, and present it at annual meetings, and talk about how it's important for you all. But manufacturers and software writers, and even people that write templates for reports, the FDA says no. That's forbidden. Just like they don't want Apple to tell you that when your heart rate's fast, that you're having a heart attack or you have tachycardia. That's illegal. Okay, so it's the exact same kind of way to think of it. Um, so medical thermology provides a unique physiologic information into the availability of any other objective study. You just can't see with any other objective study the findings that you see in medical thermology. And we take these skin temperatures, if you will, and all that we're doing is it's not a camera. It's a microbarometer infrared imager. It's a highly um, sophisticated piece of technology like they might use in Desert Storm or in the military. In fact, they do use it. Okay? And it gives you these temperature ranges. Uh, gonna, the pointer's not going to come out, so I'll just have to move. Each color represents in this particular palette a one degree centigrade change, okay? So it, the computerization, if you will, converts that infrared image, that infrared technology data into a color so that our minds can map it and see what we're looking at. And these palettes, just like an MRI or any other study, are different depending on the kind of study being done. In today's case, we're talking about neuromusculoskeletal studies, in particular studies with this autonomia, because that's what you all have, RSD and CPS. So by seeing the distribution that those color changes occur in, in this case, the mapping provides insight into the generator. And we've been about that for instance, the day I started my practice, what's generating this response? Why do you have this? You can say I have this because I broke my leg, but guess what? That may not be why you have this. There's a ton of reasons you could have it, but on the simplest level, it could be because maybe the ligaments around the fracture, which are innervated by the autonomic nervous system, never healed or the nervous system never stopped monitoring that. The fracture is healed. So I always do this, and we're not going to get through this in an hour. Who, has anyone here ever sprained an ankle? No, I'm going to pick, pick you because you're not expecting it. Can you, can you tell me what it felt like? Horrible. Horrible. What was the first thing you felt? Like really cold and then really hot. Ah, but it's just a sprained ankle. That's normal, right? That's an autonomic nervous system manifestation. It's not a motor nerve that made you move, right? It's not a sensory nerve that stuck you with a pin. Yet if I said to you, does it feel numbish, you would have gone, yeah, and it burns. But if I stuck you with a pin, you would have gone, ouch, and it's like where the doctors go, okay, he's one of those, right? Because it's innervated, supplied by, generated by the autonomic nervous system. It's not a dysautonomia because it went away. It's when it doesn't go away that we have a problem like RSD or CRPS. Okay? So most people actually have experienced sympathetic pain. It's just not abnormal. Okay? So we want to know what are the things that would track, would create a thermal image, would we create what is really called a skin galvanic impedance response or a sympathetic skin response that would help us see, oh, you know what, this guy's ankle's tracking all the way up his back, but it's coming from the ankle. I can see that. Now I don't have to go through 20 things that might be generating it. I actually have a, a concept of my, by what might be causing it. That make sense? Everyone, can we, we're so good? If I talk where it doesn't make sense, just say, hey, go, you know, you're, you're doing it, okay? Um, so images obtained under cold stress our um, just call, what we call cold presser tests, are studies that can be used to assess dysautonomia. So the medical literature is very strong on this, that if I put you in what's called a cold presser test, where I make your heart rate go up, and I prove that your blood pressure and heart rate are going up, and I'm making your autonomic nervous system do this, it's called a cold presser test. It has nothing to do with thermal imaging. It has nothing to do with CRPS. But if I've done that to you, and I'm measuring you on thermal imaging, and you don't equilibrate, there's something wrong. You don't expect to take a cold glass, a hot glass of water, put it in the refrigerator, one half's cold and one half's hot. You expect it to equilibrate. And I expect you to do that too. So by doing a cold presser test, it's like a glucose tolerance test for diabetes. I'm stressing the system because I want to see how it functions. And we'll go over a little bit some, not everybody functions the same way. It is not a picture of pain. 
And like any other diagnostic study, clinical or, or medical study, clinical opinion is required to ascertain the causation or the generator of the objective findings. A physician has to see you and do a history and physical examination to make a clinical determination of what this finding means for you. And that is a position statement, by the way, the AAT. You can say thermal findings. You can say in cases where there are thermal impressions, like thoracic outlet has a true thermal impression. Otherwise, it's a thermal finding. You have to be a doctor and do your job and figure out what's generating it, whether it be a CFS leak infection, gadolinium, or anything else. Um, no other test can map the vasomotor cutaneous manifestations of dysautonomia. There's just no other way of, you can put a, a temperature tab and say, oh, I, I, I checked your temperature. I have a temperature right here. But that doesn't give me a map of what might cause that distribution of findings. Thermal imaging is required for that. Touch, vision, cold pressure tests cannot ascertain the type or distribution of vasomotor instability. And that's what thermal imaging does. We're using scientific medical thermology under controlled conditions to objectify the results of a cold presser test. And what does that mean for you clinically? Make sense? So equilibration is a norm. We expect you to equilibrate, like we just said. And we have, um, on the American Academy of Thermology, has internationally peer-reviewed guidelines. And these have been written for quite a while now. They've been peer-reviewed and written and rewritten, and they are rewritten every three years. Neuromusculoskeletal and breast is being rewritten next year. And then we have oral systemic, which was done last year, and um, veterinarian, which was done last year. And so every three years, we all the experts get together and say, what's changed? What's new? How do we tighten this up? How do we make it better? It's just the way the medical federation, if you will, writes guidelines. That's how we do this. So there's some criteria. And the criteria is, for example, for musculoskeletal, for this disorder, that you're looking for a one degree centigrade change from side to side. So one degree centigrade is significant. Oh, this is 0 0.5, this is 0 0.75. You might think that it's you know, maybe a soft finding, depending on what it is, but it's not what we'd call a cutoff finding, like a lab value, where this becomes readable. Um, and typically we have you equilibrate, which means you have to be in a cold, like this room's a little bit of a cold presser test, okay, for 15 minutes. Disrobed. We don't want you know an air conditioner blowing on you. We don't want your you know hand like this. We don't want you um, changing your skin temperature. And then every 15 minutes, the way we do our cold presser test, we re-image, and I'll show you why. Because we're seeing over time how does your autonomic nervous system respond to that cold presser test. So here's an example of a con uh, controlled condition. Um, tell me if the mic's not going to work because I don't have a lapel and the laser doesn't work on angle. Um, so if you're right here, you'll see that these are asymmetric. They're just not the same, OK? So you can see they're just not the same. So if I did a single test after a 15-minute equilibration period, I would say, oh, this is, this is asymmetric. This is consistent with dystrophy. Um, and then I might read, of course, I would read where I find it. And the easiest way to read it is just describe the anatomical location. There's lots of other ways of reading it. But you might say, for the physicians in the room, on the dorsal aspect of the forearm and the dorsal aspect of the hand in particular in the third through fifth digits, there's an asymmetry pattern. Okay, So that would be one way to read some of these findings. Okay, but if I did it again in 15 minutes, you're, you would still read it in this case, but they're not quite as obvious, are they? The person's starting to equilibrate. And if I did it again in another 15 minutes, now it's looking comp completely normal. And you might be that person. You literally might be that person. You may just have a system that's slowly responsive, but it's still working. By the way, you could be the reverse. You could look normal and I'm done. But if I put you under additional cold stress, you break down. Okay, so we very much, one of our protocols is that you need to do this over time, not just a set of images. Okay, and we have standardized study protocols. And one of the reasons these are standardized, and some, I'm speaking to y'all, um, if you will, forgive me, because there's some physicians in the room and I want them to hear this too. Okay, so if you did an MRI, let's say you went to you know, Charlotte Memorial or you went to Prisma or you went to Novant, it doesn't matter. And everybody did MRIs differently. Got an MRI of your neck, and everyone did them in a different sequence. Do you think they would know what to do from hospital to hospital? Do you think they could like, take that data and promulgate it worldwide and say, hey, we figured this out? Thermal imaging's like that. So the AAT has an international association called the um, Artificial Intelligence Infrared Imaging Alliance. And we have internationally standardized, peer-reviewed protocols for 
different clinical sets. Because one of the things that we have now created is DICOM export and an AI database in PAX, which has never existed. That's where all the hospitals actually do their imaging, store their x-rays. It's why you can go view them. For the first time, literally the first time, this is now available in thermal imaging, and all of a sudden we have medical schools calling us up and saying, we need to start teaching this. And that's going to help you guys a lot. Okay? And that's who we are, and that's what we're all about. But you want to be taking these protocols within that framework so that you're part of that AI database, so that you're part of what's going on in the medical federa federation, if you will. They call it the federation. Cold stress studies are easy to do. Um, AAT has, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but the AAT has published how to do cold pressure tests. We don't actually care how you do them. There's a thousand ways of doing them. We just care that you've proved that you have done them so that when you're doing your thermal imaging, we know you've actually done an autonomic stress test, and that's what you're monitoring. There's, and we give you tons of ways of you, that you can do it. And I think that's really enough for this slide for this audience for right now. Okay, what does a typical CRPS RSD case look like? Now, I just showed you a protocol. In our case, we take 36 images, and we're doing it every 15 minutes. So there's a lot of images. These slides are for teaching slides right now, so I'm not showing you every image, okay? But in the case of CRPS, basically everything is asymmetric, okay? And we're gonna, this, this image just happens to be the lower extremity. It's the, if there is such a thing as a thermal image in neuromusculoskeletal, it's RSD, CRPS, Braleu, um, thoracic outlet. We actually have what we call thermal signatures that are essentially diagnostic, okay? Breast, not so diagnostic, but there's strong information. Oral systemic, strong information, but not necessarily diagnostic unless it's a facial dystrophy, for example. Okay? So if you have every view of every part of the limb is cold, it's CRPS RSD. Many of you in here will not have this. You'll track in only a portion of your limb, which is what I need to know because this tells me one thing on how to treat you. If it tracks in only a certain portion of the limb, that tells me how to treat you a little bit differently. It gives me different choices of the treatment options. Okay, so it actually helps with treatment, which is really what it's all about. Okay, um, most people have not read the book. That was my whole point. You may not look like this, even in a properly done study, but that's the classical thermal image. So clinical correlation is advised. These vasomotor maps are variable. Um, you know, in this case, we're looking at a change that only showed up on, on the posterior aspect of the buttocks. By the way, this happened to be a sciatic nerve entrapment in the piriformis. Okay, and um, in this case, you might see that the um, asymmetry pattern just on the dorsal aspect of the foot because the person actually had gout. Okay, you have to know your patient, and they didn't tell you that my labs are elevated in uric acid. They, they just, you know, you get these things read from people that haven't seen the patients. Anyone that's seen patients know histories are incomplete. You've got to drill down and get them. Okay, and so, you know, that's one of the reasons it's wrong when you go and somebody else is taking your history, and then you go see the physician, and he didn't really do it. I mean, none of us really like that, right? It's just better if the person in charge actually did it. But medicine's changed. So inflammation, infection, vascular disease, clotting disorders, and, you know, really the immune system, you know, you're going to get a great talk on um, different things that can cause this, whether it be gadolinium, whether it be mycoplasma. There's a ton of things that can cause your autonomic nervous system not to want to equilibrate and work properly. And the treating physician has to know that. He has to care and he has to start. This test makes him start to think. It makes him or her start to think. It makes, that's what's so great about it. It teaches you how to start looking holistically at patients. The findings affect care. What should be the point? What would be the point of doing a sympathetic block? Let's say um, I had this case. We're just showing an upper extremity case, and I won't get into the details of what people use and what counts and it doesn't count. But there's no way to measure, like in a lumbar block, whether or not you did a block above the level of pain, if you never monitored where it goes up or above the level of vasomotor instability. You have to see. So if I'm going to do a stellate ganglion, you might get lucky if it's frontal, that's cold, but you're better off doing sphenopalatine ganglion or even cervical sympathetic ganglion if you knew that. Or SCSG works great for C23. Okay, so when you see where that vasomotor map is, I know where I have to go to treat. It's kind of like there's an accident on I-85 on I right at Billy Graham Highway, and I'm going to block the traffic getting to it on the wrong side of Billy Graham. You've got to, if you don't do it, you don't know, okay? That's the point. 
Okay, and this individualized decision making, um, these are like a lot of medical things, but we have things called dermatomes. Um, sometimes a thermal image will actually track in a dermatome, even though it's not a dermatome. But it paints a, if, you're, if you understand dermatomes, if you're trained in that, it pa paints a picture in your mind. Oh, I get an idea where this instability is coming from. Now I have to remember what can cause it. Well, it might be a nerve root, but you know what? Ulnar collateral ligament here would track in a C8. So would thoracic outlet. So would a cervical rig. So would scalene spasm. I mean, there's lots of things that would do that. On the other hand, it's not radial carpal ligament. It's not ECRL, because I know those things don't track in that. So if you're understanding that, because that's your training and what you're looking at, it helps narrow down the list a lot. Most of you have heard of myofascial pain, when you, know, you press on a muscle and they, you feel the pain and get that tingling. We call it nulliness, by the way. When you say you're numb, but you're not, when, when you, you know, stick with the pin and it hurts, but you say you're numb, we call it nulliness. That's autonomically derived numb sensations. Most doctors don't use it, aren't going to be familiar with it. I was taught it, but that's what we call it. So when you get this nulliness sensation, then you know, that's probably, that alone is enough reason for them to start looking for this. If you have pain that skips a joint, like you see here in all these ligaments, this is like an interspinous ligament strain in the neck. And so you'll see, it always skips a joint. If your pain, oh, I got this pain, it's terrible, it burns, it goes down my leg, I feel it in my foot. How's your knee? Knee's okay, but down my foot is terrible. It's not nerve. It's not coming from your back. It's sympathetically derived. Okay? So you can start giving clues to the people taking care of you. Hey, you know, this isn't classic sciatica, I get it. But you do know what a sclerotome is, doc, don't you? No. Well, let me show you this paper, and can you refer me to somebody who does? Okay? But you, you, Bess will tell you this, all my patients, they're like, I, my, my gig is you need to be empowered. Nobody gets back well on this. If you don't, first thing is it's a hard thing to manage, period. There are no, there are no silver bullets. But everyone's got to be rowing in their own direction. And the more ownership you take into this, not just, oh, I own it, like, I own my RSD, it owns me. No, I don't mean that at all. I mean the ownership in terms of what Beth said. We're going to do something about this. I'm going to be in charge of how my decision making goes, and I know what affects me, because I'm starting to pay more attention to the things that I didn't pay attention to before, instead of just being so, you know, fight or flight about it. Okay? So that's part of where we come from in terms of teaching you to be part of the process, and you need to be part of the process for this. Anyways, my point was is that, that myofascial pain is sympathetically derived. Dural pain is sympathetically derived. So if somebody has a dural puncture, maybe they just have a, a disc, but it's not a surgical disc. The dura, the coverings of the spinal cord, every physician in the room knows this. It's supplied by the autonomic nervous system. And it gives a different thermal map. Okay? And I'll, we'll show some pictures of that. So this would be, is just an image and, uh, for this group and because I'm talking too long, too much. Um, it doesn't matter for the, for the patients or the clinicians, the people in the room, it, that I show you what each image, how it tracks. For, for a physician, you can see that this track is tracking what we would call an L4-5 distribution. Okay? It just matters that it didn't show up in every view in this case, but you still have it. Okay? It's just that where it's presenting can be, is variable. So, when you look at the distribution of the findings, you can start asking yourself what's generating it. Scientific medical thermology provides a pictorial presentation of the distribution of vasomotor instability. A working knowledge of physiology, anatomy, must then be applied to identify the possible generators. I feel like I'm like really getting into this today. Am I going too fast? Are you with me? Is this good? We're okay? Okay. All right, and all of you didn't read the book as well. In fact, we, it's not just you, it's any medical conditions. Like, you know, the patients, you didn't read the book, you know, so like you didn't get it perfectly right. And, you know, we need to figure out what that means. Okay, so in addition to there being not a full limb that might be cold, in addition to there being only a distributional pattern that might be asymmetric, warm or cold, less than 5% are going to be warm, you might have just specific little findings. And this one's called the angry backfiring C syndrome. Okay, and this is where you have warm hyperalgesia. So warm is what hurts, not cold. Do any of you have that here? Where the warm makes you worse, not the cold. 
Okay, it's less than 5%. But you might pay attention to it, because sometimes if you're like one of those that this doesn't quite work for me, I don't get it. If it's really, really hot, I heard. But it has to be really hot. Okay, so to me, the way I think of that, the way I think of that, and I qualify that, okay? So think of a circuit breaker in your house. You know, you put a microwave on it, the breaker pops. You reset it, it's okay, you pray, you forget about it. Your breaker is regulatorily rigid, okay? I can't stand the, way, the rain or the cold fronts when it's winter, but I'm okay in the summer. The more extreme the temperature is, the less your autonomic nervous system can regulate. That nerve membrane is just not working as well. Under the greater stress that it is, we call it total load. As that load increases for you and it's individual, it breaks down. So yeah, I can't do good with storms when it's 90, but I'm okay like, you know, when it's you know, like 80s and stable. That could be why. Make some sense? Okay, so in, also in this particular variant, cold actually makes people better. In this particular variant, cold actually works. We can use this to help um, describe which physical therapy or restorative modality to use in different patients. No reason to put in this patient warm or hot packs. They're going to do worse. They are allodynic, which means they have a non-painful, they have stimulus, painful stimulus, excessive painful stimulus to something that would otherwise be considered non-painful. Okay? That's called the angry backfiring C syndrome. It's due to an axon reflex. The end of the nerve membrane is going boom like a car that's backfiring. It's backfiring, literally. And when it's backfiring, it's um, due to an abnormal calcium-dependent potassium channel, which has medical implications in terms of pharmacology. There's another subset called triple C. In this subset, we have a very intense area of coldness, but it's usually distal, farther away. They don't do well with stellate blocks. They don't do well with epidurals. It's just too far away. They just don't do as well, okay? And it's called, it's, we call it cold hyperesthesia. So you're very, very, um, in, in the presence of cold hyperalgesia, you're very, very painful to cold, but you don't actually appreciate that it's cold. You appreciate it that it's pain. Okay, that's called the triple C syndrome. That's the way it presents. Your skin is cold. I might put this ice on you, and you would go, ouch, and you'd go pretty cold. You'd go, no, it burns. Okay, so it's excessive pain to cold, but not necessarily, it's almost like a nully sensation to cold. It's not the cold, per se. Does that make some sense? Okay. And it's due to a hyperexcitable, fast potassium voltage gate, a different pharmacology approach. And that has a direct clinical impression on the medications I might prescribe to you. I might prescribe to you one medicine that's a, like gabapentin that's just going on that calcium-dependent gate, and I might give you mexitol on somebody that's going on the potassium-dependent gate. I need to think about my pharmacology that's deri directed towards what's your actual problem. Because when I don't, I don't give you a drug to make you numb. I don't give you a drug to zone you out. I give you a drug to help restore your nerve membrane. Everything I'm doing is to restore fix the root cause. And RSD frequently does not exist alone. You, you know, again, not a lot of people read the book, well, I have RSD and nothing else. That's not that common, actually. Usually you have other things, postural orthostatic tachycardic syndrome, people that stand up and their heart rate goes fast and their blood pressure drops out. That's a dysautonomia, okay? Fibromyalgia, two out of three say they have weather-sensitive pain. They don't have dystrophy. They're never going to get skin loss. They're never going to get bone loss. They're never going to get the tracture. But they have a dysautonomia for sure, and they definitely have weather-sensitive pain. Myofascial pain we went over. Thoracic outlet we've gone touched on a little bit. Borrelia is a kind of facial dystrophy. Even restless legs can be autonomic. And fight or flight, does everyone get that the panic that you get, the fight or flight, is a dysautonomia? Do you all understand that? Did you tell yourself to do that? Every one of you just reacted. Not one of you told yourself to, did you? It's autonomic, okay? And some of you, a lot of you, your autonomic nervous system's on overdrive. It's in your brainstem. It's the same disorder. So when you panic, because this is getting bad today, and you go to the ER and they don't know what to do, you're feeding that flame. Okay, and we have tools that we use to help quiet your brainstem down, because anything we do to help regulate your autonomic nervous system is gonna help this. Again, reducing total load. Even ADD, PTSD, they actually have dysautonomia components to them. 
So be open-minded about dysautonomia. Um, your doctor should be looking at all of your symptoms. <clears throat> Everybody's going to be a little bit different. Everybody's going to have their particular um, inputs that is increasing their total load. Again, we call it reducing total load. So clinical examples. Um, I've talked about thoracic outlet. This is actually a true thermal signature. And we call it a thermal signature because if you read anywhere on thoracic outlet syndrome, this is what it's going to look like. <clears throat> they all have this shawl-like pattern where there's, you know, it's like they have a shawl on their shoulder. And then there's an asymmetry pattern tracking on the medial aspect of the arm and the forearm. They just don't look the same, do they? And there's only one thing that does that. It's called thoracic outlet. It's not C8 because it's not from elbow down only. When you get all those findings together, it's TOS. We have a ton of tests that we do for TOS. They don't work. In my view, this is the only one that actually works. The doctor has to tell you what side it's on because you can be warm or cold on the symptomatic TOS side. Okay? So you, again, have to do your decision making. Borreliu, the posterior cervical sympathetic syndrome of Borreliu. It's a cervical traction. It's like a ganglion, the sympathetic ganglion. When you get a stellate ganglion block, or a lumbar sympathetic block, think of it like a freeway interchange. There's no traffic lights. It's independent of the nervous system. It works all by itself. And we're just clearing out the traffic because it's all congested. All right? That's basically what they're trying to do. In my office, we do some things that we're trying to stabilize that nerve membrane so it doesn't pop all the time. But that's what they're doing. In the posterior cervical sympathetic syndrome of Borreliu, it's usually some kind of traction injury, some kind of back and forth injury where that chain gets tugged. And that's the person that maybe is in a mild accident. Everyone else thinks it's mild. And he, you know, he goes, yeah, well, I got a ring in my ears now. Or you know, I get nauseated and my eyes don't accommodate like they used to. And you know, okay, this one's not going to be so easy, okay? It's a dysautonomia. And it shows up on thermal imaging. It may show up over the frontal aspect of the face, over the maxillary aspect of the face. It may show up over the scaling. Usually there'll be a hot spot over the omohyoid and or at C23. We call it a thermal signature, and it's defined in the AT guidelines. There is no other test that can, that can objectify that disorder. Fail necks, fail backs. The recurrent nerve of Lushka, there is a, it's a regular sciatica nerve. When you think of it, we're talking about the nerve root that comes, comes along towards the front of the leg, if you will, where the front side and the back side of the nerve roots, the rami, come together and create a, a sciatic trunk, if you will. And the recurrent nerve of Lushka, <clears throat> what the body did is say, hey, you know, we're going to kind of send some feeders back to the spine as the, along the way just to kind of monitor ourselves. So it's not the sciatic nerve. You don't get a sciatic symptoms. It's just that spot really hurts. And by the way, it's going to uh, monitor or innervate the interspinous ligaments, the ligaments between the spine bones that hold it together. Ligaments hold bone to bone, like tape. Or it's going to innervate the synovia, like the coverings of the joint. You know, anything that's sympathetically innervated is going to supply it. And that may be backfiring, because it may not like that somebody was in there mucking around with it. Or it may not like that you had a sinus infection that is stuck right in that spot, right there, and just won't heal. There's a ton of things that can make this thing go wrong. But the important thing for this talk is that you can see it. So I know what I'm going for, and I can monitor whether or not I've actually affected a change at that location. Atypical head and neck pain. <clears throat> this is a person with a, a lung cancer with, with post-radiation brachial plexitis that um, you can determine whether or not you need to treat that. I've seen gunshot wounds to the head. The gunshot wound wasn't what was hurting them. They had a facial dystrophy. All I had to do was look at it, tell me where to block it, they were better. Fibromyalgia, we've covered. Um, this is a case of post-herpetic neuralgia. And again, this is our temperature bar. So in this particular temperature bar, this is cold, this is hot. It's not supposed to be asymmetric like that, but it can give me an idea of what kind of intercostal or thoracic blocks I might want to do. So, and then you can have RSD or in the presence of multiple generators and comorbid disease. So in this particular case, this is, would be tracking in what's called an L5-S1 distribution. This is somebody with dystrophy, if you will. And we call these dystrophy even though they're not. Does everyone understand that? You know, classic dystrophy is you progress to where, you know, you don't just have skin temperature change and pain. You, you get loss 
of skin. You get loss of muscle. You get loss of bone. I've seen people where their hand looks like saran wrap. I mean, literally, the bone is covered with saran wrap. Okay, I've seen lots of stuff. That's a classic case of dystrophy. It's not actually a classic case of dystrophy, but it's definitely sympathetic pain syndrome. So we call everybody's tissue Kleenex. Okay, so we just call it dystrophy or CRPS. It is a chronic regional pain syndrome, right? You know, that part they got right. <clears throat> it's just that you can have a chronic regional pain syndrome because, you know, you got your finger blown off and it hurts and no one's done anything with it yet. It's not dystrophy. <laughs> That's a regional pain syndrome, <laughs> okay? So the name's not a very good name per se still. The classic name is still the better name in my view. But the point is, is that this is a sympathetic pain syndrome that's tracking an L5-S1 distribution. We'll call it RSD, especially the more weather sensitive they are and the more that they respond to classical treatments for sympathetic pain. But it's not classic dystrophy. That's all I'm trying to say. Because classic dystrophy, I already told you, the thermal signature is every view should be cold. Right? Most of you aren't going to be that. Okay, but this person also had a total hip arthroplasty on the right, which is why it's showing up somewhere that it doesn't belong in the, L4, in the L5-S1 distribution. They had a hip replacement. And once you have sympathetic pain, you already know it's not a good thing to have another surgery done, especially in that area or any area, but definitely not that area if you can avoid it, right? In addition, this person um, has varicosities. So we're seeing findings on this thermal imaging that aren't all dystrophy, that aren't all sympathetic pain. And that, again, requires a clinical evaluation and treatment with a doctor-patient relationship. Don't forget low-hanging fruit. Um, there's arthritis. There's degenerative disc disease. There's ligamentous strain. You can see that on musculoskeletal ultrasound, x-rays, electrodiagnostics. I've seen plenty of patients that were referred to me with dystrophy. I did an EMG. They had a normal L5-S1 nerve root. I did an epidural. The dystrophy's gone. No one treated it. You know, up. Oh, you have dystrophy, you crushed your, you know, your foot. Well, guess what? You've been walking along for so long, now you got a nerve root in your back, and that's actually what's causing most of your problem, but no one looked. Okay? So don't miss low-hanging fruit, because it's easier to treat. Reduce total load. Treat the easy stuff. Um, we, I'm also a fellow in vascular medicine, so we do our, our own vascular studies. We check for peripheral arterial disease, venous disease. We do carotid duplexes. We do vasoreactive studies in the neck to make sure you don't have a dysautonomia that also can be shown in your vessels in your head and neck, so it's just more widespread than just your limb. Check your lab, whether it be for, um, you know, your, from your radiation, from rheumatic disease, from inflammation, from hidden infection, coagulopathy. Do your laboratory. A lot of times there's approaches that you can do that. I've cured cases of dystrophy by putting people on antibiotic protocol, just a medicine every other day. I'm literally, because it was from a hidden infection. Got rid of the infection, the nervous system resolved. It can happen. Don't have tunnel vision. Out of sight, out of mind does not work in patients with CRPS. Scientific medical thermology helps with differential diagnosis, diagnosis and the formulation of a treatment plan. And even a negative study helps because it helps you go in a different direction. In this case, the doctor would typically look at it. They would see blue fingers. They'd say, oh, that's just vasospastic disease called Raynaud's, which is a dysautonomia, and they would just not go any farther and treat it. But if they would have done thermal imaging, they would have seen that that tracks all the way up the arm. This is not just Raynaud's. Uh, it helps decide injection therapy, what kind of injection, where to do the injection, where that's for trigger points, superior cervical sympathetic ganglia injections, phenopalatine ganglia injections, epidurals, brachial plexus blocks, cervical plexus blocks, certain peripheral nerve blocks. When the last one is a caudal injection. These are things that all quiet down the autonomic nervous system. Um, cervical pervertebral blocks, um, if you have, for example, somebody with neck pain that maybe there is arthritis, interspinous ligament strain, and it's uh, autonomically derived. And you can do that um, for intercostal blocks to help you to know which location and where to do the, those. Radio frequency ablation, at least, it, you, at least you have an idea of what it is you're trying to ablate. Uh, you know, it's a, just another objective study of where to be treating. In intrathecal pumps, it'll tell you where you need to be, uh, whether you either missed and did dural, dural puncture or where you need to do above if you're going to put that pump in there because there's no point in putting it below. On regenerative medicine techniques, uh, we published several articles on using, um, you're supposed to call them um, whether medicinal sim signaling cells or structural support cells. And the day when the FDA didn't regulate us, we call, call them stem cells. But in our case, we harvest usually from your own body. This is a nurse who had a fracture of her uh, trimalleolar fracture. 
and she wasn't able to walk, and we were able to do the thermal imaging and to see how high up and in what distribution she had the instability. We actually did, in her case, um, a, a graft from her own mesenchyme, from her own fat tissue, and we were able to transplant those stem cells into her calf, and that's, this is what she looked like after that. So regenerative medicine is a way, even prolotherapy is a way to actually shut down overdrive of the sympathetic system. But you've got to put it in the right place, and you've got to be aware that you could aggravate it if you don't do it right. And botulinum injections, this is one of the uh, earlier cases that I saw of a woman that came in. She said she was a knockout operator for J.P. Stevens, which meant that she had a hammer and she was knocking out the holes for the, in the carpet in your car for your ashtray and for your overhead lights. And I'm a knockout operator. That was her job. And one day I was knocking out and my hand turned blue and it turned cold and it's been doing this ever since. And she was referred to me to rule out carpal tunnel. Okay, well, you don't have carpal tunnel, but... I'll get this test done. <laughs> okay. But I mean, you can see why they didn't know what to do, right? So scientific medical thermology matters. There are simply more options. The focus shifts from treating symptoms to treating the source. It provides an approach to put quality of life, quality back into life. How do you participate? Advocacy is key. You, I cannot say enough positive of uh, Beth and Steve and this organization. They put on annual programs. They provide educational support for our annual scientific sessions, which are intended for physician training in promulgating and promoting this field. Educational grants for medical training. We now have labs in, in medical university programs at Temple University. We're establishing one now at Med University of Miami, Department of Pain Management, Ophthalmology, PM&R. She's mentioned University of Arizona. We're going to help bring them on board where they have a much better concept of this overall view of what we can do to help provide a medical application for this modality. And all of you just being here today are part of that process. The American Academy of Thermology provides education. We have um, internationally peer-reviewed guidelines. It counts. You can't be in medicine and say, well, this guy said this. It can't be Bobby said this. It's got to be, okay, we have many countries whose society have said the same thing and said, this is the way to do it. Now I can start listening to you. This is the way doctors are. If they want to be part of what's called the Medical Federation and actually promulgate this. There's always doctors on their own, and I was one of them for decades. I'm just doing this, and I believed in it. But now we're trying to make it prime time. We're trying to make it mainstream. We're trying to make it so everyone has access. Physician and technician training courses so that they're taking these studies within the proper protocols, cold presser tests, reading the studies properly, annual scientific sessions, like Beth said. These talks become much, much more technical when they're an annual scientific session for physicians. Medical advocacy and awareness programs. We have an atlas of normals and abnormals so that people can correlate them to traditional medical studies. The doctors are trying to learn what does this mean. And we have an extensive knowledge center and um, uh, a literature center for helping everybody see all the publications that are out there on this. And publish, 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 publish. You have to publish in medicine to go anywhere. Beth revert to uh, this book that I published several years ago on resolving complex pain. Um, I then published uh, in the uh, Rehabilitation Medicine uh, and Thermography from, was published by New York uh, Medical University and just came out. I mean, literally, March this year just came out. This is a big one in my book. It's published by Elsevier Press. Elsevier is a well-known medical publisher, and they have secrets for each of their medical specialty societies that the residents hold in their pockets and study from for their board exams, which means that if you're going to publish in this book, all the residency board reviewers have to approve it, because it's going to be on their board exams, right? So we have a chapter on dysautonomia is more common than you think in the use of thermal imaging for these diagnostic conditions. And I promise you, not only did the editors go through this and peer review the heck out of it, they said, Bobby, we're sending this out. We're going to send this to other medical universities. All of them love it. They're all starting to come on board. It's good. You're actually getting mainstream medicine to start paying attention to this. $69, you can buy it online. The thermal imaging chapter is online because it's in color and they gave us more space. Show it to your doctors, educate yourselves, read it. So, um, I did okay. I left a few minutes for talking. Um, I know I said we had 10 minutes. It was perfect timing. The momentum is here. The time is now. Okay. So I have about 10 minutes or so left. Um, so question and answers. Um, I want to know how you mentioned 
Lushka or whatever, how the piriformis and sciatic relate. Okay. And can you have both at the same time, or would you be able to see it? Yeah, you can have both at the same time because you might not have read the book. Okay. No, so, so, you know, it's kind of like somebody, you know, medicine, we go through this like, man, that guy's schizophrenic. Yeah, but he's got dystrophy too. <laughs> You're allowed. You're allowed to be both. <laughs> you know? <laughs> All right. So, the recurrent nerve of Lushka, it's just was described by a person that is like a back feeder. It's like on the way out, but I'm going to kind of monitor myself. It's on the way out, I'm going to monitor myself. It happens to be richly supplied by the sympathetic system. Tons of sympathetic fibers in that branch, which is why we can see it. Okay? Piriformis is a muscle that crosses, if you will, the hip. Okay? It goes into the posterior uh, part of the hip on this side and then higher up pretty much into the sacrum, if you will. And through the piriformis, dives a nerve, a trunk of nerves, what we call the sciatic nerve. So you could have, for example, an active recurrent nerve of Lushka. That's it's like overactive. It's like your circuit breaker is constantly firing. It's constantly can't holding. And that crosstalk is making it down L5S1, causing the piriformis to lock up. That could happen. Yeah. They but, keep telling me it's piriformis, so... But if they treat the piriformis and it's not working, it's because they haven't found what's caused it. Now, it, having said that, you can look on musculoskeletal ultrasound in the tendon. The piriformis is one muscle that kind of is a different kind of insertion origin process. But they could be torn or stretched or weak because you've been walking wrong. And you can just prolotherapy on that, regrow it, repair it. And then, you know, if it doesn't work, you need to be looking at the others. Or if you did the injection, that really hurt Doc. Well, they're not supposed to really hurt Doc. You're telling me there's a sympathetic component. Yeah, it's really worse when the weather's bad. You're telling me to look at this. Yeah. Does that help? Yeah. No, it does. Is the scientific medical thermology covered by most insurance companies, or is it all considered experimental? Or Can you repeat the question? People on Zoom can't hear it, the audience. So when you... Okay. Question is scientific medical thermology covered. So AAT has a position statement on this. We never seek about Medicare or the government because it's the government, but third party payers pay it, not because we're billing for medical thermology, we bill for the cold presser test. And we use medical thermology to document the results. And that gets covered. Okay? You know, it was kind of interesting to be honest with you. Uh, one of the things that's really changed. I don't know if it was COVID or just life and society's evolving, but when University of Miami called us up, they were like, they're on board. They're like, they're doing this. Great. And um, when we told them, well, you know, if you do it under cold presser test, you can get paid, they go, all the better. It, if you didn't sell them that before, they weren't listening. Okay. Breast thermography, which is a whole other topic, not covered. Okay. But it's the cold presser test that's covered. Now, you may know about, it's not why I'm here, but you may know the FDA's just set out dense breast notifications. The doctors in the room know about this. So if you get a mammogram and you have a dense breast notification, you have to be told that the mammogram's not that good. Medical thermology is approved by the FDA as an adjunctive test. So maybe that'll change, and we're doing position payments, statements on that right now. But it's not neuromusculoskeletal, which is why you're here. So it could spread, and it can be in multiple places. But even if it has, it's not likely to have spread symmetrically. Okay. okay? And we have uh, several publications on RSD and spread. Um, and it helps, of course, to have serial studies. But it's not likely, even in cases of spread, that it's going to look exactly the same side to side. Uh, my, so I ask because my original injury was both sides. Yeah, and it may be that this would really help you identify where you need to be treating. We see a ton of it. Um, there's a lots of failed joints, and there's lots of joints that just anybody who's got a joint implant and says the weather bothers them, it's, it's, it's autonomically derived. It's, it's not dystrophy, right? But it is a sympathetic pain syndrome. So it's not that I can tell you that if you get a joint implant, you're going to get sympathetic pain. No one can say that. 
now we can say what are the predisposing things and all the perpetrators, and we can say you were set up, and we can, but there's nothing that says because you had a joint implant, you're going to get this. But if you have it, and you know you have weather sensitive pain, this can make a huge difference in how I treat you. All right, I'll take that as it's a good time to exit. Thank you very much. <laughs>